Okay, so just a quick um, intro on myself. Um, I've been investing in venture in early stage now for about eight years. I'm based in Dubai. I've lived in Dubai now for 12 years and have been in the region for a while. I'm the founder of Wayne Women's Angel Investor Network, which is the first uh, women angel investor group in the region. And um, I'm part of a bunch of other um, funds as well in the US and Europe. <clears throat> so I've invested now in about 100 early stage tech companies across the US, Middle East and Europe. And we'll be talking mainly from that perspective, although I think what's happening with COVID is pretty much unprecedented. Um, but you know, I'll give some advice based on my experience, especially through some of the more recent um, shocks that we've seen. Our fund, Mindshift Capital, is, um, is focused on creating a mind shift in three different areas. The first is just we're investing according to new values that we see that are, are based on the rising millennial. So this is Gen Z millennial. New values focused on different, um, different things like uh, diversity, inclusion, and also um, ubiquitous. Uh, the second one is we invest uh, across the, the universe um, globally. So we're focused on the MENA region, but we do invest um, outside of the region as well. And thirdly, we apply a gender lens to enhance financial returns. So that means we invest in companies where at least one founder or co-founder is a woman and is also active on the management team. Um, I won't go into this so much, but these are the four sectors that we really like. So food tech, fintech, health tech, and ed tech. Um, and we like these sectors because this is where we see the shift occurring most, most prominently in terms of the, um, our fund thesis. Uh, and also this is actually just given what's happening now, I think with COVID and where we're going to see more of the um, focus, definitely these, these sectors are at play. So we've already seen a lot, of, a lot of disruption to the ed tech market just over the last few weeks. I don't know how many of us have kids at school, but just moving into distance learning has, I think, been a big shift for all of us. Um, these are some of the companies. I'm sure you'll recognize some of the logos, but Mindshift has invested now in about seven companies. So we've invested in Lunch On, Little Thinking Minds out of Jordan, Sarwa, which is, is based in Dubai or in the, the Emirates and is a, the first licensed robo-advisor in the region. Kids and Tara.ai um, are the investments that Mindshift is in. So um, what I, what I want to talk about maybe is a little bit about what we've done so far as an investor, because this might be helpful to those of you who are founders on the call. And basically, and again, things are changing so rapidly with COVID that it's hard to keep on top of it. But one of the first things we did was just did, we did a survey of our founders of our existing portfolio companies, but also our pipeline companies that we've been um, looking at over the last month or so. And I thought it might be helpful to share some of the results with you based on what we've seen so far. So one of the most interesting things I thought, I didn't expect this, but over the majority of the founders actually saw COVID as both an opportunity and a threat. So not just as a threat, but really as both. Um, and, you know, obviously certain sectors have seen different things. So um, so an ed tech company, this is a massive opportunity for them because the schools and, and the parents and the, the students are really relying on this new way of learning now that we can't actually go to school in person. So, and universities as well. So companies like Little Thinking Minds, uh, Localized, another company called Getby, which is focused on the education sector. Those are, those are companies in the region where we see massive opportunity for them. Um, and also, of course, some of the other companies that I didn't mention, but are also in this space. The other interesting thing that I guess is not so surprising, but more than half of the founders have witnessed massive impact on their business. Um, so um, with certain areas being more affected than others. So, um, so obviously sales has been massively affected. 85% um, of the founders that we surveyed actually see a massive effect and you know much lower than forecast numbers, unfortunately. So that's been, I think, the most prominent um, pronounced effect of COVID. Human resources, obviously the way that people are working, we're working remotely, um, and then the changes that we've got to make to just positions, but also to things like cutting salaries, 
um, and, and uh, other changes across the board. Maybe some reskilling as well. <clears throat> Operations, about 45% saw um, a little bit less than half, saw a big impact on that. Cash flow, so that's another, another challenge for many startups right now. Um, over half of them have already been reducing their customer acquisition cost or CAC to address the, the issues. Um, supply chain, especially for the e-commerce companies, um, the online grocery platforms, they can't secure supply fast enough to meet demand. And then finally, fundraising. So this is obviously an, an area that's going to be affected just in the coming months. It has been affected but about a third are, are, have already accelerated their fundraising plans just based on the funding environment that I'll talk about in more detail in the next slide. Um, we asked about runway, of course, and this is one of our first concerns as, as investors, and about 24% of the founders have cash runway for more than 12 months. So um, we're actually recommending 24 months of runway if possible. I know that's really tough for founders who are just you know, haven't come off of funding rounds recently, but um, but that's, you know, kind of the main idea of this is to just preserve cash for as, much, as long as possible because there's so much uncertainty right now that's been happening. And then what was interesting, we, we asked about marketing. We saw that um, a bunch of founders, 60%, have become more creative um, in terms of partnering with new channel partners, offering freemium models to attract new customers, uh, working with other startups and collaborating more. So, um, so there's really an opportunity to think about different ways to market in order to decrease um, overhead or just um, burn rate. So first and foremost, and I think this has probably been talked about a lot, but just one of the most important things for founders has just been the check-in. So, uh, so my family, my employees, my customers, and my business, and this is where we see people starting to focus now, is what is the impact you know, over the, the coming weeks, but also the coming months as we get more information about the impact regionally, but also globally. So the spread across different markets has given us more information about what might be happening uh, and what we expect, for example, based on what happened in China, Spain, Italy, and is now happening in the US, especially in New York. Uh, the funding environment, I mean, I think what I'd like to say here is what, what I'm seeing often is founders are very focused on what's happening in the region, and we need to think about the macro level impact of all of this. So, for example, uh, let's not, you know, let's keep in mind that the crash of the stock market and then, of course, oil prices that have been the lowest in, in a very, very long time, that this is really going to affect the funding environment generally. So at a macro level, there's less liquidity than there was. Uh, and then if we think about fund, venture capital funds like MindShift, a lot of us uh, take money from, from institutional investors. So the early stage funds and funds like MindShift, this is our first vintage fund, so we're not as affected because we've got a lot of high net worths. And luckily we did our first close uh, in February and um, and did a capital call immediately. So we've got capital to deploy, which I think is, um, there are some funds like ours in the region who are in that, that nice position, but funds that are just starting to fundraise now, it's gonna be very difficult because what we're seeing overall is that, that investors are just holding back, waiting to see what's going to happen. Um, a lot of us just aren't sure. There's a lot of uncertainty in the market. So until we have more clarity, it's difficult to then deploy capital. And if we think about um, some of the sovereign wealth funds who had high exposure to the public markets, the pension funds, uh, even high net worth individuals who may have had a lot of their investments um, in the equity markets, their net worth has now dropped by 30%. Uh, and that's a massive hit for a lot of them. So I think, you know, especially in the US amongst angel investors, we're already seeing that, that effect. Um, and they're going to be more concerned about the, the impact on their own net worth and then their family's um, overall worth, net worth. So I think net net, <clears throat> we expect that pricing is going to be coming down and a lot of investors are really holding out just to see what emerges. I mean, the expectation is that this will turn into a buyer's market 
That hasn't been the case over the last few years, but that's um, what we're expecting to, to start happening now. So here's uh, an example from um, 2008 and looking at that financial crisis and, and where the different um, stage of investors were or investments were affected. Uh, what's interesting here, and this probably isn't what a lot of us would expect, but the seed, round, seed stage companies and the seed funding rounds actually recovered first. So Series C was actually much later to recover, but uh, seed, seed stage was much faster. So that's good news for companies that are going out and um, raising seed rounds. So I, I was asked to share a few, uh, a few tips. So before we get to the scorecard and how to evaluate the risk, um, I think you know tip number one, that's pretty obvious, but I'll say it anyway, is just look at your burn rate and your runway. So look at how much capital you've got in your bank account, take out your bills that you've got to pay in the next 30 days, and then divide by your monthly cash burn rate to get to kind of your estimated runway time to zero in months. So, uh, so this is essentially figuring out how, how long you can last without either raising a new round of capital or just generating new revenue streams that might not have been in your forecast. Uh, tip number two would really be testing your assumptions about revenue. So, uh, so a lot of us have been operating in a totally different environment to what we're seeing now. So some of the assumptions that we made about that time are also no longer relevant. Uh, if you're selling B2B, you know, have your customer sales dropped? Are your customers closing for the next several weeks? Are they laying off people? Um, if so, how are you going to readjust your forecast for the new, new environment? And I would say be conservative here because we just don't know what's going to come. So we need to be as, um, as conservative as possible and really think about this realistically. If you're selling uh, to consumers, so B2C, where you uh, use the multi-sided market, so kind of B2B2C, are you tracking changes on a weekly basis and daily basis to compare against past periods? So a lot of uh, founders in this space might look at monthly changes, but right now it's really important to track even on a daily basis to look for red flags and signals that things are starting to change about their behaviors. Because as you look at the macro level picture, if people start losing jobs, if, um, if other things start to happen at that, that uh, economic level, there will be a trickle down effect that might change, for example, you know, food delivery purchasing or um, grocery purchasing or whatever it is that you're, um, you're focused on. There's an angel investor who I really, really respect and like in the US named Pat LaPont, and he's written a couple of blogs that I, I recommend reading, and they're included in this, this deck so that um, you can refer to them. But he actually was a founder in 2001 and 2008, and he shares his lessons from those time periods. Um, I won't go through all of these now, but these are really some, some important things to think about. Um, so again, I think part of this uh, from a founder's perspective is being very realistic about what's happening now, and I think being very fast to act. So what I'm observing in the region is that there's sort of this feeling that this is isolated, you know, and, and because maybe our markets haven't been as affected by COVID, we're not as, as prepared to address and make changes um, rapidly. But I think, again, the changes that you can make, you should make, and I'll talk more about those, and I'm happy to take more questions on those, but a lot of this is really be about being prepared to act and react and um, set yourself up for success in a very uncertain market that we're, we're moving into. Um, so again, I'm, you know, everyone's aware of this, but venture is high risk. We know one in 10 make it. Um, so now what's happened is so much of the market has shifted so that, um, again, what, what a lot of us go into is sort of positive bias. We think that we're going to be the one in the 10 that makes it. Um, and I think that's partly true, but we also have to think about how, how does that um, what, are the, what are the changes that are happening? What are the milestones that will make your company very uh, more attractive to investors and materially less risky 
And then, you know, most importantly, can you make those milestones with the cash that you've got on hand? And finally, before I go into the um, scorecard, uh, so timeline and contingency planning, and this to me is the, the I think most, um, the most concerning and the, the one that I struggle with the most, and I think a lot of us do, but we just don't know how long this is gonna last. So I just was reading a, um, a survey done uh, of VCs, and I think it was about 30 VCs, and the survey grouped the VCs into two different categories, the, positive, the optimists and the pessimists. The optimists think that, that this is going to, we'll start to see recovery kind of end of 2020. The pessimists think this is a two-year cycle. So when we think about venture, you know, we're thinking about kind of, I'd say, 12 to 18 month um, fundraising cycles. And if we think we're actually in a downward recession, that, you know, some think may even result in a depression. Um, we've just got to think about that in terms of how we're planning. So the easiest thing, and I think the most practical response is to create scenarios. Um, so again, if this is three to six months, then immediately freezing variable spending is something that, that, um, that really, you know, you need to do immediately. And I think a lot of companies have from what I've seen. And then if it's going to be longer, uh, you know, you need to start reconfiguring your business. So this is what Steve Blank calls the life boat strategy. So what are the minimal things that you need to keep your company alive and what, what can you actually leave behind? And then if this is more than one year, you really need to make some much harder choices about the business. And I mean, again, your goal is to continue and to be a going concern. So, um, you know, kind of getting down to a skeleton structure so that you can keep the lights on for the 18, 24 month period until we start to see a rebound in the cycle. And again, create scenarios, identify what the triggers are for you. So if you're in the ed tech space, you're waiting for information about the schools and how maybe changes in school fees are going to affect your business and your sales cycles. Um, so again, are the triggers based on the time period of the lockdown? Are they based on, on other factors? Um, so what are the main triggers for your business? And then just iterate ruthlessly. So keep, keep readjusting as you're getting more and more information. Um, this is a, a chart that I really like. Um, this is one of, this is a, scenario, a Sequoia backed company that actually came up with this, but I think it's a good way to think about the um, scenario planning and scenario planning can get very complex very quickly, but basically you're looking at kind of creating three different scenarios and you, based on those three different scenarios, you come up with um, three different plans and that, that helps you understand what your changes to OPEX need to be to secure a certain runway. So, you know, if you've got to cut OPEX by 15% because your, the lockdown is much, um, much longer than you expected and therefore you don't have as much cash on hand, uh, the only way to preserve that cash is really reducing costs. So, um, so based on this, you can pretty much see how you've got to react and respond. So I definitely, uh, recommend going through this. This actually, you can download this. It's even in an Excel format, so you can go through it and do it yourself as well. They've made it open source, which is really great. Now, um, we've come up with kind of a, a basic scorecard, and um, and this is meant to help founders really identify risks or sort of what we call their COVID readiness. So usually we're talking about investment readiness. In this case, we're, we're talking more about um, readiness to address the impact of COVID. So we try to keep it simple because we want founders to be able to use this. And it's, it's, it's a one, it, obviously this could get a lot more complicated, but then you're introducing more complexity that maybe isn't, doesn't make it as easy to see what the areas are where you need to really address issues. Um, so we've tried to look at the kind of the key business um, units and then how to evaluate them. So when you're going through this scorecard, really it's meant as a way to understand where you've got gaps. So, uh, so you might, you know, for example, and the ratings here, it's kind of one to three. So one is low readiness, three is high readiness. And just for the purpose of this example, 
we're assuming that it's almost perfect. So it is perfect. So getting threes in every single category, each indicator, and then each section um, to get an average score of what we would call high COVID readiness, which is uh, three. Um, but for example, if you change some of these different variables and got, let's say your cash flow, you only had six months at runway and you got a one there, that would change the outcome of, um, of the score. So not, this isn't weighted, it's not a very complex, um, it's not complicated math, <laughs> let's put it that way, but I, I think going through this exercise will help you see what the gaps are in your business. So for example, if you're looking at planning and, um, and haven't actually gone through any scenarios, then you know, you're just status quo, which would, would mean that you would end up with a one here. If you've actually already gone through, made some changes for the next 12 months, you know, we would give you a two. Um, if you've come out with different contingency plans and identified what the triggers are, then to me, that would be high readiness. So that would be a number three. Um, governance, uh, this is really critical in times like this. And this is, I think, during this, this time and, you know, the, the, <clears throat> just the environment that we're operating under, governance is really, really critical. So if you don't have a board, um, then I would think about setting one up pretty quickly. But again, I would call that a number one um, for the risk, <clears throat> the readiness. Board meetings scheduled, you know, you're ready to talk about it and talk about what the impact of COVID is. You're reporting to your, your, um, your board about what's happening. I would give that a two. And then a three, an example of high readiness is, you know, you've, you've held the board meetings and to discuss COVID, you're meeting monthly. Um, so you're, you're really on top of it and you're really taking the governance seriously. The board is holding you accountable to certain um, certain KPIs that you might have adjusted downward based on COVID. So, I mean, that would be an example of high readiness. Um, communication is really, really, really critical during this period. So I think especially because we're not meeting in person that we've got to figure out different ways to, to communicate. Um, so, you know, here basically we came out with, you know, the letter to employees, letter to customers and letter to investors. <clears throat> I've seen over the last week um, many more letters to customers, which is good. So usually there's a letter from the CEO um, just kind of reassuring customers that you're still there, you're still operating, your workforce is now remote. Um, I think what I haven't seen as much are letters to investors. And there's a company actually that we invested in in the U.S., um, not through Mindshift, but through a U.S. fund called NextWave that whose investment committee I'm, I'm on, also an investor in. And this company, literally, it was like March 10th, sent out you know, an investor letter, a revised deck, including the impact of COVID, and then also an ask in terms of um, raising capital in order to just preserve cash. So immediately worked on getting 24 months of cash in, which you know, I thought was, was really impressive and very proactive on, on behalf of the company. So again, these are really critical things. If you haven't done those things, I recommend doing, doing that and continuing to be in communication. This isn't just something you do one off and then go back to business as usual, but you've really got to keep you know, communicating, use social media, use your online marketing channels to keep people updated and to remind them that you're, you're there and that you're still working. Cash flow uh, runway is really um, a key, key uh, area of concern, I think, for a lot of um, founders and also investors. So you've got to figure out a way to preserve cash. Um, you know, ideally, you've got minimum six months of a runway. Ideally, 24 months is what we're recommending in this environment. But, uh, but if you don't have cash, you've got to figure out other ways to get it. So an easy and quick and easy way is to go, if you just, let's say, closed around maybe three to six months ago, go back to your investors, reopen the rounds. Maybe they want to increase um, under those terms. Um, maybe there are other investors you can bring in. Um, so I know a lot of founders are concerned about dilution and future dilution. You know, I understand that and that is something to consider. But at the same time, you just want to make sure that you're actually still there. So if the choice is, you know, go out of business because you run out of cash versus maybe you're 
dilute it by an extra five to 10%, you know, I think a lot of us would choose the, the, um, the dilution over the, the going out of business. Um, so this is kind of, you know, I've heard some people call this wartime CEO <laughs> um, mentality. This is, this is what you've got to think about. Um, and just, it's not easy. And I know it's really tough, but again, just figure out ways to preserve cash. There are other funding sources. So there are more government options that are coming out. UAE has announced a, um, a funding facility through the banks. Um, I think we'll see more and more through the various government ministries. The U.S. has, has been um, put out a package. European governments are announcing new um, facilities. So you've just got to figure out how to take advantage of those and what makes sense, um, including some of the subsidies for workers and employees that they're offering as well. Um, and I, the World Bank has, is also doing things that some of the, I think the multinational governments will, the development finance groups, I'm sure, you know, EBRD and some of the other groups will have packages that they'll offer as well, whether it's concessional loans or grants. I mean, all those things are good to take advantage of. Um, I was on a call yesterday with three Chinese founders who were describing what they had gone through and they talked a lot about taking advantage of tax breaks, um, different government funding options, and you know definitely do that as, as soon as you can um, if you wanna continue to be around. And then the other way to secure cash is just cutting costs. So if you wanna extend runway, so cutting your burn rate. Um, again, the founder who I mentioned from the US, uh, they cut their burn rate by 50% immediately. Um, so there are lots of ways to do that. One, one um, quick way is, you know, kind of uh, salary cuts. So management team members take a 30% salary cut, the rest of the team 20% cuts, uh, leave without pay. Um, and then obviously the option that I like the least and just because I think it's, uh, we also want to be mindful of just families who rely on jobs in, in this environment, but, um, but if you can't, if you don't, if you no longer need an employee, then you need to lay them off. And um, hopefully there's a way to figure out another role for them, maybe with a startup that's doing really well and over capacity in terms of demand right now. Um, so this is, this is a time when labor mobility in these countries makes it more challenging, but they're trying to be more flexible about that, I think. Um, we just got an announcement in the UAE about um, just, you know, you can have part-time workers and they can take on other roles. So just like in the US, it's, you know, a big kind of ethical dilemma right now, but um, Instacart just hired 300,000 Uber drivers and contracted them. Um, so again, be creative where you can, and this is where partnerships and working together across the ecosystem, I think is really helpful. Um, sales, uh, so again, um, so, you know, a low readiness would be if you're seeing declines in sales, high readiness is increases in sales, because this means for you, this, it's probably an opportunity, not a threat. Um, again, you just need to be evaluating that. So some, some founders aren't really looking at this on a rolling basis, but you've got to be really quick to understand the, the drop in sales and what that's coming from and what's driving that. Um, supply chain and logistics. So this might not be relevant for everyone, but I think especially for um, the e-commerce platforms, looking at kind of metrics around delivery, inventory, um, identifying alternative sources. Uh, one of the things that we see a lot now is, is um, almost all the delivery channels are contactless or claim to be contactless. A lot of them really aren't, but <laughs> say that they are. So that would be high readiness because that means you're, you're alleviating customers' concerns about you know, potentially contracting COVID from the driver or um, the delivery that's being made. So, um, so that would be a, a good way to, to mitigate some of the risk. And then on inventory, this is a really tough one because obviously if you're heavily dependent on goods coming out of China or Italy or a market where there's been a real cutback, 
there's only so many alternatives that you can create and we are limited sometimes locally on what um, we can source, but, um, but at least being aware of it. And I think communicating that to your customers so that they're not shocked when they go to make an order and they realize there's a three week wait time or they get contacted the day before that none of the things that they ordered are, are actually available. So that means having really good inventory uh, management tools uh, on hand that, you, that give you real data about what's happening in your business. Uh, human resources, um, just again, employee compensation. So no change would be probably one because um, that doesn't instill confidence that you're really looking at what's happening in your business um, realistically. Uh, Two or medium readiness would be um, making cuts. So again, some of the salary cuts that I explained and then high readiness would be really implementing contingency plans. So for example, if you've just hired a team in Saudi and you're expanding into Saudi, but you haven't actually launched there yet, being aware that if this you know, lockdown goes on for let's say two more weeks or one more month or whatever the time frame is based on your OPEX, you might have to create a plan or um, implement a plan where you, you'll have to cut that team. So, um, so those, those need to be very clear in terms of the time frame and the expectation and what the action will be by, by, um, by the management team. Headcount and skills. Um, so again, if you're not making any changes and it's kind of status quo, that would indicate low readiness. If you're looking at potentially a hiring freeze, um, again, depending on your business and what your, which business you're in and also what stage you're at in terms of your development. Are you early stage? Um, are you growth stage? Um, a lot of this is different for different businesses, but, uh, but if you've you know, kind of issued a hiring freeze, then that might be a score of two. Again, contingency plan where you've said, okay, I just I have all these salespeople, I can't actually use them now because we're B2B and we can't actually engage in any sales meetings. I'm either gonna have to let them go or I'm gonna have to reskill them or ask them to take you know, three months without, leave without pay so that they still have jobs and get, let's say their health coverage and um, you know, the other benefits that they need. But this is a, a way to enact some cuts pretty quickly and to address human resource issues. Um, and then finally, the marketing. So take a look at your marketing plan, see if there are changes that you can make. So if you're, let's say, you know, a fintech that's consumer focused, probably doesn't make a lot of sense right now to invest in, um, in customer acquisition, just given that people are in this. Again, it, you know, it could make sense if you're, let's say, a flex pay or a, a um, a business focused on um, digital payments, but given that people can't access banks easily, but um, again, depending on the kind of business that you are, you need to just look at what your marketing plan is. Is this, you've got, you know, sort of limited budget for marketing. Is this the best time to spend it in terms of the ROI on that budget? And then um, decide either you're going to make changes or, or you don't need to make changes. So, and then maybe being more creative, you know, trying to do more things for free, partnerships, um, identifying new channels as well. This is something else that came out a lot with the um, Chinese founders who have gone through the cycle that we're just kind of starting now, but, um, but a lot of them really recommended expanding your business um, in terms of looking for alternative um, channels and then also, if you're only B2C, then figure out a way to go B2B as well so that you're diversifying. Um, so just to close, uh, based on the scorecard I shared, I think the most important things, again, are preserving cash. Um, so some quick things you can do, extending your most recent funding round to existing investors. Maybe you bring in a few more investors on those terms. Uh, make some salary cuts immediately, 20% uh, for all employees across the board, 30% for the more senior members of your team. Cut marketing for growth if it's not a good time. And then again, 
really engage in very iterative planning. So normally we'll look at a 12 month budget that gets approved. I would do three month, six month, nine month, 12 month rolling budgets. And those will be adjusted as you're getting more information about what's happening kind of in your market and just generally across the, across the board. Um, focus on governance. Uh, if you can get your board to meet monthly and if they're hands on and add value, I would recommend that. Reach out to your advisors more, ask their advice, uh, make sure that you're not just working in a, in a kind of a um, echo chamber where you're relying on your own view of things or maybe you and your co-founder or your management team have a certain view, but that might be the view in Egypt, but that <clears throat> might not work in Dubai, for example. So, um, so you just wanna make sure that you're getting as much input and feedback as possible. And then think about other things you can do with your employees if, if you are in the difficult position of potentially letting them go. So, um, so one challenge right now is that there were a bunch of companies that may have raised close funding rounds, but they can't actually, you know, kind of um, deploy that capital in terms of just hiring and also preparing for the, the uh, next stage of their growth. Um, so if there are creative things you can do where you either contract them to other startups or businesses or, you know, asking them to take a few, a month or two leave without pay, then um, that means that you can at least be ready for the, when the things revert and go back to the um, more of the business as we know it. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, customers, employees, investors, your board, all your stakeholders, just we might think we're communicating, but um, we're probably not communicating as much as we think we are. And uh, we really need to be more vocal about what's happening with the business and just ensure that we're reaching people who are harder to reach now, that we, we don't have the in-person contact. And then finally, I would say, you know, use this time wisely. So if you need to work on some things operationally, and maybe there are functions and tools that you can use that will help you to automate more of your business. If you've been thinking about going SaaS, but you're not really ready on the back end, then invest in that, spend time on that, uh, really look at your strategy, take the time to be a little bit introspective and reflect. I know it's not easy just given that a lot of us are really worried about families and other places or just what's happening with the economy and the world in general. But I think this is a good time to really just go inward a little bit and think about where you want to be or in the next year um, and how do you get there and just really focus on strategy. And maybe you'll find some things out that could result in a pivot or maybe there's some new information about the market that would change the way that you'd like to run your business. So this is a good time to to reflect and think about that and, and make those changes. Uh, these are some resources that um, I th we can share after the call. And then I think I'll stop there and just see if there are questions. Amazing. Uh, well, we have a number of questions for you. The most, uh, the most common question is, can you share with us the presentation to download it after? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and um, I'll start off with some questions us as Rise Up had, and then I will we'll open it to the rest of our audience. Uh, one of our main questions was, does the scorecard apply to both companies who've seen decrease in revenue as a result of COVID or both ones that had suffered decrease or increase? I think, I think both. I mean, um, it still, even with, if there have been, you know, increases and you're on the positive side of what's happening, then you still need to prepare certain things. So, um, so one of the challenges those companies face are, maybe going to be scaling and, and growing um, faster. So that still means that you've got to make changes to your HR, the way that you're doing things. And, and uh, I mean, again, you know, this isn't, it's not like you can make adjustments to the scorecard based on your own business, but I think the important thing is that you're going through and really thinking clearly about each one of these different parts of your business. And you might, so, you know, the easy thing to focus on is cash flow and runway, but but even if you're in a growth stage, you still, you're gonna need more cash because, because you need to hire people faster and be ready to meet demand or maybe you know, purchase inventory if you're in e-commerce, for example. Awesome. 
another question was, uh, if you're still not exactly sure what the business strategy will be in light of COVID, would you recommend communicating with your customers something vague but optimistic or wait until you have a more concrete way forward? I think, I think just communicate. Um, you know, vague isn't always great, but <laughs> but the I think especially some of us and myself included, we like to wait until we have perfect information before we communicate. Sometimes, I mean, it's kind of like an MVP. You know, you just get it out there. And as long as you're not going to say, tomorrow we're launching this, and then actually you don't launch that, um, I think just communicate something uh, because it's just, it's again, you just want to remind people that you're there, you're still running, you're, um, you're live, and you're aware of what's happening. Well, uh, I'll open the questions to our audience. Uh, first question is... Should I, do you want me to stop the um, screen share? Or is, is it useful to have it up? It's useful, I think. So. Okay. Uh, well, no, we can actually pause it. Yes, let's please pause it. Um, okay, so the next question was by Shelly Porges. Uh, she's asking, uh, what do you recommend for fund managers raising capital at this time? Um, I think it depends on where, and hi Shelly, <laughs> I think it depends on where, um, where they are in their fundraising process. Um, you know, I, I've seen a bunch of different uh, different things happening. So I, I think like, for example, with us, we did our first close uh, last month, so we're in, we're in a I think a good position. Um, fund managers who are just starting now, I would actually wait a little bit before going out to the market, and I just I still get the sense that people aren't ready to look at new investments. Um, we're still trying to just figure out where we are, what's happening. Um, you know, maybe give it a couple weeks before going out, and then things might change as well. I mean, valuations are being cut different types of business sectors are more attractive. So that might also affect the fund thesis for fund managers. Um, and then, I mean, we're looking at things like extending our, our final close because we know that there's going to be just a period between now and then Ramadan and summer where things will be quiet in terms of fundraising. And I think that's also good advice for founders as well. Just you know, I always tell founders don't raise during the summer or at end of the year, just because people are trying to either, you know, go off on their beach holiday during the summer and just get things off their desk or just finish things kind of um, there, just get things off their desk at the end of the year, just as the year is coming to a close. So, so there is a bunch of just psychological um factors that you need to consider. I don't know how that's going to be affected though by COVID. That's still not, are we all going to be so tired of spending all this time with our families that we're all going to want to like go out and just spend all summer working because we're just happy to be back in that environment. I mean, that's, that's what I'm not sure about still. So um, yeah. Definitely. These are all, the, it's going to be a new norm that none of us can predict. Yeah, exactly. Um, another question by Farida, uh, what can investors do to support startups? I think one is just, uh, you know, spending more time with them, with their, uh, with portfolio companies, but just with founders in general. I mean, I, I get the feeling a lot of them are really kind of like, you know, this expression we have in the U.S., deer in the headlights. They just don't know what to do. They're really just unfocused and feeling overwhelmed, like we all are. I mean, every human, I think, in the world right now is feeling like this. So if you think then you've got a business that you've got to make decisions about um, and you've got people relying on you for decisions, um, they need support. I, I know there are a bunch of different even mental health platforms that have come out more and more recently to kind of provide that support for founders. But being a founder, you know, I've been one myself, it's just, it's incredibly lonely, even if you've got co-founders and partners. So I think, for investors and you know whether it's your portfolio company or not just be more more approachable i mean i'm spending pretty much all my time on calls with founders and just i mean some of them like two three times a day you know i'm talking to them so i think uh making ourselves accessible and and being there for them doing 
more founder office hours for the founders that we don't know directly, but might be you know, people who need support. Um, and then just doing, you know, offering, um, offering help where you can um, uh, during these times. Uh, webinars, um, a lot of founders don't know what to do. And that's part of why we did our, our survey was to just get an idea and sort of a gauge of what was happening on an aggregate level. So not just talking to one or two companies, but really talking to 15. And we've done follow-up calls with all of our companies. So we know um, what's happening directly on a much deeper basis. But I, I think they also, they also appreciate that. Um, we did then, after we did the survey, we, we held a call with all of them. And I think they really like having the peer learning. So normally I do a monthly founders breakfast at my house, but because we couldn't do the breakfast, we did the, the call. And I think a lot of them really um, appreciate knowing from each other what, what they can do because there are some things that they just haven't thought of. Absolutely. Uh, if, uh, so I have another question from Salma. It's like, if my startup is in an industry that has seen bump in revenues like grocery delivery, should I approach VC firms today? What is the likelihood of investments happening in today's climate? I think, I think it depends on uh, what stage you are and, and what, you know, how much money you need and are you raising a seed round? Is it a series A round? Um, I, I think first, and I just was talking to someone yesterday about um, some of the demo days and the companies that are coming out of accelerators right now. I think it's really hard timing, unfortunately. Um, we're trying to look at some of those companies, but frankly, just with the support we're providing to our portfolio companies, it's, we're just distracted. So I think, again, even the demo days, I would, I would push those off if possible. And if you're going to raise a seed round, um, I would look more at maybe getting together a smaller round and just getting more individuals involved because I think especially for more of the funds that are, you know, distracted by their portfolio companies and maybe also fundraising for their own funds and trying to figure out their own capital deployment strategies. I mean, I don't think for, I know that there's been different, um, different things coming out, but I don't think for a lot of us, it's business as usual. This is what, um, you know, a lot of us are trying to think about, do we deploy new capital? Do we keep more capital on hand as dry powder? Because we know our portfolio companies will need it more going forward. And these are the discussions that we're having internally. So I, I imagine other funds are having those same discussions. Um, so again, as a founder, I would maybe let the dust settle a little bit. I know the timing's tough, but um, but before going out to market and raising around, I think it would, it, you know, everyone's trying to figure out what the new norm looks like. Um, so I'd probably wait a couple of weeks. Hussein, I think you're muted. Yeah. Uh, another, <laughs> question from, <laughs> another question from Islam. It's, uh, should we go back to the business model that is steady or continue with our high profits till, uh, without a solid pivot? Um, well, I think if your business model is, is strong, then no need to change it. Um, but I think the question would be, is it still strong in this current market environment? So, um, so again, looking at your revenue assumptions and testing those and really being clear because something might look fine even last week, but you might start to see changes this week. And that's, that's how, how quickly we're seeing some of these market changes that are happening. Uh, another uh, question from Bridget. Uh, it's a, hey, if it's a tech startup in the pre-seed stage, should we be waiting to spend the cash we have on building our platform or should we hold off till we have more clarity? Also, since uh, our platform is for gig and remote work, would it be optimistic, optimistic to think we would be able to raise more seed funding to hit the market by the summer? Thank you. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a really hot space uh, right now. So, so I would definitely um, you know, build the tech and, and also look at raising a seed round um, earlier if you can. Um, the spaces that I think are really, really hot right now are you know, remote work, remote education, future of work, uh, e-commerce is coming back. Some of the 
like online food delivery, like Blue Apron, Hello Chef, those, those uh, are also um, becoming big. So again, I guess the question of a lot of investors is, is this just kind of a market blip? And that comes back to the timing and the contingency planning. Is this the next, you know, three to six months? Is this the next 12 months? Is this two years? Then um, that will change the kinds of business models and the sectors that I think a lot of us look at just because I mean, when I look at my parents who are in their 70s are now, you know, avid online grocery shoppers, <laughs> those are consumer behaviors that I think are going to last. Um, the consulting industry, it's not going to go back to normal. I mean, how many, how many clients are going to want to keep flying uh, consultants out, paying first class business tickets and five star hotel stays when they now know that those people can do their work just as effectively from home, so um, remotely. So I think there are going to be some things that really are going to change and some of the behaviors. And now, now that people are, are doing more of it, um, I think those will affect the kinds of business models that come out of this as well. Well, has MindShift made any investments recently in the light of the current conditions? And if so, in what industries? Yeah, so there's one um, that we are, we are um, finalizing. So I can't announce it yet, but, um, but it's very relevant to to uh, to the this environment, so um, we actually had started due diligence on the the business, and then this happened. And um, yeah, and I mean the companies had to like scale up their cloud servers, and is doing really really well. So I think it wasn't like we just started looking at it because of COVID, but but COVID definitely has helped a lot with their sales. I think revenues have gone up ninety percent over the last two weeks. So uh, that's always a nice thing to see as an investor. <laughs> um, well, we have uh, time for like, I think two more questions, two to three more questions. Uh, so I'll go ahead. Um, Talal Aljil is asking, why do you think seed stage companies recover faster in turbulent times? I, I, yeah, it's a, I think it's more, it's, it wasn't, that slide wasn't really so much about seed stage companies, it was more seed stage rounds. So, um, so I think if you look at later stage, like Series C rounds, um, if we think that the next stage after Series C would be IPOs or the public markets, now doing an IPO would just be death for a lot of um, companies or investors, so we won't see as many of those rounds, but I think seed stage, you know, there's, there are new opportunities, valuations also um, will be much lower. So it's, it's a lot easier to take risk on maybe a seed stage company that, that um, hasn't already come out with a priced round. So um, the danger is on the later stage stuff, you know, it's already been priced and then the investors who are in that business might end up doing a down round. Um, so yeah, so I think that's that's probably why we, seed stage recovers faster faster than the growth stage funding rounds. Agreed. Uh, Mahmoud is also asking, uh, what are the chances of P two P across border money transfer startup to have a pre seed fund in the current situation, and how much could the deal be for? <laughs> okay, hmm. that's a it's hard to answer that without knowing what the business is. But um, no, I think I think you know one of the things we've we've all been aware of for a long time, but the whole FinTech space really is just ripe for disruption. Um, just yesterday I was talking to somebody in Jordan who was telling me about not being able to basically pay her, her employees because they couldn't actually walk in the streets to go to the, the bank to get paid or to take withdrawals from the ATM. Um, so again, if you can't do it remotely and digitally, then how do you make these payments? I mean, it's, it's crazy. So. So I think there will be much higher demand for those kinds of um, businesses once we come out of this. And I, I know that there have been some new funding rounds that have been announced. Um, Pre-seed is just, is always hard, I think. I, th I still think it's a hard round in this region because investors still are probably more conservative than maybe investors out of the US. Um, you know, the markets here are just not as, as robust as what we would see in the US, for example. So even you know angel investors here typically are investing more i would say at kind of like uh, kind of seed or 
post seed rounds where there's more traction and they can evaluate the traction. So it's not easy to do a pre seed round. I mean, in that sense, you probably have to rely on, you know, a few angels who just get what you're trying to build. But I think it's possible. And I think that will be a really hot sector, you know, as, as COVID um, calms down a little bit. Def uh, well, we have time for one more question. Uh, Salma is asking for subscription based startups. Would you recommend offering customers the option to downgrade or pause their subscription to offset their potential cancellation down the line? Or should I wait to see how things play out given the MENA market's impacts are still unclear? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. Um, I just was talking with a company that just did this recently as well um, in Dubai. So I think uh, I, maybe it depends on how you communicate that option to your customers. Um, you know, definitely having them pause is much better than just not, not paying for their subscription. Um, but I think the way that you frame that to them needs to be just very clear. So, um, but I think just given the, the environment and the, the changes that we're seeing happening here so quickly, it would be the right thing to do. Uh, the same? Uh, yep, the screen freezed for a sec. Uh, well, uh, we have, uh, do you have any final, uh, final takes do you want to let us know? About? <laughs> I think, you know, it's, this is a really hard time and, and nobody knows exactly how to think about this. I mean, this, you know, while it's, we can look at time periods like 9-11 or 2008 and these financial crises that happen, but this is still, I mean, I don't think anyone's really lived through a pandemic before. So, so the insecurity and the uncertainty that people are feeling is totally normal. So, um, so again, don't, don't worry, you know, things take it day by day, uh, do your contingency planning, think about the different, you know, the triggers in your business and what those are, but don't, don't overthink. I think you also need to keep it, keep it simple. Um, and again, you know, reach out if, the, if you have really um, issues or questions. I'll share the presentation. There's some really good, um, I've included some links to some of the, the I think, good advice. Um, and yeah, just uh, take it one day at a time and, um, and hope that everyone is staying healthy and, and well and taking care of themselves. And, really keep, keep this all in perspective because, uh, you know, as, as we say with the markets, what, what goes down has to go up. So, so I think that applies to real life as well. So hope everyone can um, be there for each other and support each other in the ecosystem and anything that I can do to help, I'm, I'm here. So please reach out. Thank you so much, Hussein and Rise Up for putting this together. It was great to be here and I really appreciate the opportunity and hope that some of this has been helpful to the attendees. Thank you, Heather. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, oh, we're I... oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for coming to our second episode of Survive and Thrive and uh, we were lucky to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Bye. 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 B